ever saw your reflection on the surface of water or on the glass of windows, well you have to thank internal reflection for that. In this lesson we'll discuss the two types of internal reflection with more emphasis on total internal reflection as it is a very important lesson in the IGCSE syllabus. So stay tuned. Let's start with partial internal reflection. We already talked about reflection in the previous lessons and the laws involved in reflection. We also talked about refraction, which happens when light travels from one transmitting material to the other. However, some transmitting materials can reflect and transmit light at the same time, such as the swimming pool over here. As you notice, there is a reflection of the building on the surface of the swimming pool. This means that the surface of the pool was actually acting like a mirror. Let's try to investigate what's happening over here. If we take one light ray going out from the building towards the pool, as this ray hits the surface of the water, part of it is actually being reflected internally in air towards the camera. And that's why the camera can observe the reflection or the image of the building on the surface of water. However, at the same time, if there was an observer inside the pool, such as our turtle over here, it would also be able to see the building because part of the ray will reach the turtle's eye due to the refraction as shown. Now we can say parts of the incident ray were reflected towards the camera and other parts were refracted, maybe 50% reflection and 50% refraction. In this case we have to say partial internal reflection because not all the light reflected and it is internal as the incident ray and the reflection were both in air, internally in air. Let's look at other examples in nature. In the first picture on the right, where the girl is looking at her phone, you can notice an image of her phone screen forming on her glasses. Now this is because as the light ray came from her phone towards her eyes, part of the light transmitted through the glasses to her eyes. And that's why she can observe what's on the screen of her phone. While the remaining of that incident ray was reflected towards the camera that took the picture. Similarly, you can observe the same thing in the alligator's picture. If we take an incident ray from the alligator's eye towards the surface of water, part of this ray will be internally reflected in air towards the camera that took the picture, while the remaining of it will be transmitted towards the water. Which means if there was an observer inside the water, such as a fish or a turtle or whatever, it can still view the alligator's eye. The same thing is also observed in the car picture. The light from the environment surrounding the car hits the surface of the glass and gets transmitted to the people inside as shown. Yet, some of this light will be reflected towards the camera that took this picture and that's why you can see the image of the environment on the windshield. One more thing I want you to note is that partial internal reflection or PIR in short could happen in either one of the transmitting materials. For example, in the upper picture, PIR happened in air. The light that came from the alligator's eye was internally reflected in air. But if we place the camera in the water, if we dip the camera in the water, such as, as in the second picture, we will notice that PIR also happened from the surface of water as shown. If we take a light ray going out from the alligator's skin towards the interface between water and air, well we know this ray is going to be partly internally reflected towards the camera that took this picture. Also, the remaining part of this ray will be transmitted through air and if there was an observer on the other side of the pool, they would also see the alligator. Alright, so by now we have an idea about partial internal reflection. Let's go to the second thing on our list, which is total internal reflection. To understand total internal reflection, let's just recap what we did in partial internal reflection. If this bird is positioned over here and we take one light ray going from the bird towards the surface of water, we know part of this ray would be internally reflected to the other side and the remaining will be refracted as shown. Now if we draw a construction line for the normal, we can find the angle of incidence, the angle of reflection, and the angle of refraction. At this instant, we have a fairly large incident angle. This means it's close to 90 degrees. And a PIR is also observed, partial internal reflection. However, at a large incident angles, what we would notice is that more reflection would happen than refraction. Maybe 90% of the incident ray was reflected and only 10% was refracted. 
If the bird came closer and the angle of incidence decreased, then what would be observed is that more refraction would happen than reflection. So keep this in mind. At small incident angles, what do we get? We get more refraction than reflection. At a large incident angle, we get more reflection than refraction. This is in PIR, partial internal reflection. Keep in mind that up to this point, we were talking about cases where the light came from an object placed in air, in this case, the bird. And this light ray was internally reflected in air. Air in comparison to water has a lower density. If we change the setting and we looked at an incident ray in a denser medium, in this case, water, we would observe total internal reflection. So let's look at this case. If we take a light ray going out from the turtle towards the surface of water and keep in mind this time the light is placed in the higher density medium, we know a large portion of this ray will be refracted away from the normal. This is the normal and this is where we measure the angle of incidence and angle of refraction. The smaller remaining portion of the light will internally reflect in water as shown. Now, since the angle of incidence is small, more refraction will happen compared to partial internal reflection in water. Now, if the angle of incidence was slightly increased, we would notice that more of the ray will be reflected than refracted. So for example, if in the previous case, 20% was internally reflected in water with a slight increase in the angle, maybe now 50% of the ray was reflected. If we further increase the angle of incidence, we will reach a specific value as shown over here, which is called as the critical angle abbreviated by theta C. At this specific value, the refraction would be on the surface or the interface between air and water, and the angle of refraction would be 90 degrees. Now this only happens in denser mediums. Okay, so keep in mind that the value of this critical angle depends on the type of medium. For water, for example, it's 49 degrees. What does this value mean? Well, this means that if the angle of incidence was 49 degrees, the refracted ray would be on the surface between water and air. Alright, so now finally total internal reflection would occur. And total internal reflection happens if we keep on increasing the angle of incidence beyond the critical angle. Remember the critical angle for water is 49. If the angle of incidence was beyond 49 degrees, then all of the incident ray coming from the turtle will be internally reflected inside the water with nothing being refracted into the air. This is total internal reflection. The surface, the boundary between air and water acts as a mirror but only for specific angles if the angles are more than the critical angle. 100% of the light will be reflected without any refraction. Okay, let's quickly recap what just happened because this is very important. First thing, at a small incidence angle, a lot of the light would refract than partially internally reflect. Maybe let's say 90% of the light refracts and about only 10% internally reflects in water. As we increase the angle, what would happen? Well, now more of the light will shift towards being internally reflected than being refracted. So maybe in this example now, 50% of the light is uh, partially internally reflected in water and 50% is being refracted. However, if we further increase the angle of incidence to a certain value called as the critical angle, for water it's 49, then we would observe that the refracted ray is on the surface between air and water, and the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. This critical angle, the value of this critical angle depends on the medium. For water it's 49, for glass it's 42, for diamonds it's even smaller than that with just 24 degrees. Finally, the last thing, if the incidence angle overshoots the critical angle, what would happen is total internal reflection would occur. This means all of the incident ray, 100% of the incident ray will be internally reflected in water and the surface between air and water acts as a mirror. Now keep in mind, total internal reflection only happens in the denser mediums. Let's look at an example to demonstrate the whole thing. Take a light ray going away from the bird towards the surface of water as shown. 
Now this ray is in air, which is the lower density medium, so only partial internal reflection would happen and the ray would reach the camera. The remaining part of the ray would refract and reach the eyes of the turtle. To the camera, the virtual image of the bird would appear in this position and to the turtle, the virtual image of the bird would appear in this position. The camera would also be able to observe the real image of the bird as another light ray goes directly from the bird to the camera. Moreover, the camera is able to detect the virtual image of the turtle in this position after the ray has refracted. So if we look at the viewpoint of the camera, this is what would be observed. A light ray goes from the bird towards the camera directly, that's why the bird is being observed. Another light ray goes to the surface of water and reflects towards the camera, partially reflects towards the camera. So if we extend this ray, this is where the image would appear. Similarly, a light ray coming out as a refraction from the turtle, that would be the virtual image of the turtle. So if we change the point view of the camera and place it inside the water focusing only on the turtle, this is the image that would appear. The camera can see the turtle directly as a light ray goes from the turtle towards the camera. It can also observe the image of the turtle on the surface of water as another light ray hits the surface of water and being totally internally reflected towards the camera as shown. If another camera was placed on top in this position, then this is what would be observed by that camera. It cannot see the turtle as all of the light coming from the turtle was totally internally reflected towards the water. Alright, and that was the end of total internal reflection. I hope you now have a better idea at it. It was long, but it's very important. Now let's look at some of the applications of total internal reflection. And the first one is reflecting prisms. Let's look at the following incident ray. It hits the glass at an incident angle of zero. Therefore, no refraction would happen and the light will just continue straight until it reaches the other surface. At this point, we need to draw a normal line and find the angle of incidence, which is in this case 45 degrees. This is by following the geometry of the shape. Since this is a right angle triangle, the incident angle would always equal the angle in the top corner of the prism. Now, since the angle of incidence is more than the critical angle of glass, which is 42, total internal reflection would happen as shown, and then the light will just continue moving straight away from the prism. The oblique surface of the prism acted as a mirror. Normal mirrors reflect about 95% of light, while reflecting prisms reflect the light totally, TIR. This is important for several applications such as periscopes, rear reflectors, and binoculars. For a better quality for those applications, TIR is needed, and to achieve TIR, you need reflecting prisms. Another important application of TIR are optic fibers. Optic fibers are thin, flexible rods made up from special glass, and as light passes through those fibers, it gets totally internally reflected. As light enters one end of the optic fiber, it hits the boundary between glass and air. If we draw a normal line, the angle of incidence is more than the critical angle. Therefore, total internal reflection would happen as shown. And then it hits another boundary. So if we draw another normal line, still the angle of incidence is more than the critical and total internal reflection would happen. This process will keep on repeating itself for hundreds of kilometers until the light exits from the other end. It depends on the length of the rod. Sometimes optic fibers could reach hundreds of kilometers. So what's the benefit of those optic fibers? Well, the most important application is the use in communication to send signaled light, such as internet data. So to understand what's happening, and this is just an overview, if this router over here sends a code of 1010, now what does this signal mean? It just means that the, you switch on the light for a while and then off and then on and then off. 1010, zero, one, zero. one means on, zero means off. The pulsating light signal can be understood by the receiving end, the other end of the optic fiber, as something else, a representation of something. For example, 1010 could mean the letter A. If this signal was sent from one end to another, the receiving end will understand it as the letter A. Maybe for the letter B, it's 1001. And when that signal reaches the other end, 
you understand it as the letter B. This is how data is transferred in bits. More uh, discussion about signaled light and signals in general will happen when we study electronic chapters later. Optic fibers are all around the globe. They connect continents together for thousands of kilometers and they are usually buried under the sea. That's how internet and uh, information is accessible everywhere. Optic fibers also have some medical applications. They are used in endoscopes. An endoscope is a device that is inserted through the mouth to the stomach in order to view what's inside the stomach. Now this uh, endoscope contains an optic fiber and this is because light is sent through the optic fiber to illuminate the stomach inside because we want to see what's inside it. And then when the light is illuminating the stomach, the stomach walls will reflect the light back through the optic fibers to the other end which is the camera in this case which is going to record and that's how the doctors can view inside the stomach. Those are some applications usually asked about in the IGCSE syllabus, so keep them in mind. The last thing for this lesson is the critical angle calculations. It is possible to calculate the critical angle if we know the refractive index of a material. Now if we look at this case where the refracted ray is on the surface and we apply Snell's law from high density mediums to low density medium. So the law says that 1 over n, 1 over the refractive index equals sine i over sine r. Now at this case, we know the incident angle equals the critical angle. Why? Well, because the refracted ray is on the surface and the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So by substituting those values, we get 1 over n equals sine c and the critical angle instead of the incidence because at this instant at this value they are equal divided by sine 90 the refracted angle now sine 90 equals 1 so we get sine c equals 1 over n or we can change it to n equals 1 over sine c this is the formula that links the critical angle with the refractive index keep this formula in mind it's very handy during exam Thank you for your patience throughout this lesson. I hope you were able to learn something new. Surf the channel for more lessons, more content, more experiments, and more uh, past paper questions. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the channel.